Thank you to who else but Zane for this ducktastic Media Mementos raffle review. If you would like your idea for a Media Mementos video to come to life, then stay tuned to the end of the video and I'll tell you how. Duckman! <laughs> And with that, I hope I have your attention. Over the last few years, there have been tons of people taking to YouTube, Dailymotion and the like, talking about how Duckman is one of the most underrated adult cartoons of all time. And while yes, they're most certainly correct, very few people seem to understand what happened behind the scenes to make Duckman what it was. So gather around everybody as I tell you the complete history of Duckman. It does your pelvis, huh? It does your pelvis, huh? It does your pelvis! Duckman was created by a man named Everett Peck. Huh, a guy named Peck created a show called Duckman? It's just too perfect, am I right? <laughs> Throughout his life, Peck was obsessed with illustration, art, and animation. So once he finally graduated college, he began dabbling in some freelance work to get his foot in the door. One of his more minor projects at the time was a Dark Horse comic called Duckman. This was a one-shot comic about a duck detective with a straight-laced pig sidekick who struggles to balance his professional life and the life of his dysfunctional family. The comic itself wasn't out yet, but Peck had a lot of faith in the concept. In fact, when Peck was doing some freelance work for Klasky Cupo, Gabor Cupo himself approached Peck and asked him if he had any ideas for a show. Peck pitched the concept of Duckman, and the rest, as they say, was history. It does your pelvis! Huh? Gabor Cupo loved the concept of Duckman and helped Peck put a bunch of promotional material together to get the attention attention of networks. Unfortunately for them, even with the Klasky Cupo name attached to it, most networks wouldn't give Duckman the time of day. The duo knew that they needed more to put Duckman on the air. So Cupo funded a pilot through his own money, and finally the networks were interested in seeing what Duckman had to offer. What the hell are you staring at? There were two networks in particular that wanted to pick the show up, and funny enough, despite Paramount being attached to produce the show, they didn't consider it as a long show for their upcoming channel, UPN. Instead, the networks that took interest in Duckman were Fox and USA. Fox, of course, was the up-and-coming new channel that was the home of the popular series The Simpsons. Ooh, I won! And USA, um, let's just say that they were a bit smaller than Fox. So small, in fact, that they probably wouldn't be able to fully produce an animated series. But even so, Peck and Cupo decided to go with USA's offer instead of Fox. For one thing, Fox pitched them a very low episode order compared to USA. Generally speaking, the amount of episodes that a first season gets is usually indicative of how much faith the network has in a show. For example, shows that are risky or expensive like Alan Gregory or Drawn Together start off with seven episodes in their first season with the hopes of there being a return on investment once the show gets its stride. But if not, then they didn't lose all too much. Meanwhile, the standard 13 or 21 episodes means that the network thinks that you've at least got a fighting chance. USA was able to offer Duckman the full 13, while Fox, on the other hand, was not. The other deciding factor was creative control. Peck and Cupo believed that on a small network like USA, there was a much smaller chance of having executive meddling, and those were the only two offers they got. Even if other networks found them at least interesting, they would still consider Duckman to be too big of a risk. This is largely due to the fact that adult animation on mainstream TV wasn't exactly the norm. Shows like King of the Hill or Futurama hadn't come around yet, which means that the only other model they had to go by was The Simpsons, which was far less adult than what Duckman wanted to be. Cartoons don't have any deep meaning, they're just stupid drawings that give you a cheap laugh. <laughs> With the series officially greenlit by USA, it was time to start making the show. Klasky Cupo, of course, would stay on for the animation, and it was determined that Greg Berger would stay on as the role of Cornfed from his role in the pilot. After all, nobody was able to capture Cornfed's deadpan essence as much as Berger was. I don't know who's been calling 1-900-BABE, but it's sure jacking up the phone bill. But then it came time to casting Duckman, and that turned out to be a giant ordeal. At first, Ronnie Shell was the voice of Duckman, but that was only for the pilot. He was mostly intended to be a placeholder until they could find someone better fitting for the role. I told that temp company to send me a couple of blondes with long legs and big boobs, and what do I get? A couple of Muppets! <laughs> 
They went through numerous auditions and nobody seemed to be a good fit. Until Jason Alexander read for the part and right away they knew they had their guy. Unfortunately for Alexander, he wasn't fully aware of what the show would be. In fact, he didn't know it was a show at all. He thought it was just a one-shot episode, nothing more. So he chose a voice that was a lot gruffer and harsher than his normal speaking one, causing a lot of strain on his vocal cords. So I created this voice. Yeah, what the hell? You know, this very, going, well, I can do that for a day. And then I had to do it for four years. Um, it was tough. But even so, he wasn't about to change the voice. And even if he wanted to, I don't think the creators would have let him. They were way too happy with Alexander's chaotic, bombastic energy and Berger's flat composition. What a team. The biggest worry going into making Duckman a full series was keeping the irreverent nature of the comics in the show. Thankfully, USA mostly stayed out of the way. And as for the creative crew, they were mostly on the same page for what they wanted out of the series. A dark, irreverent comedy that had some heart to it and would ultimately take the moral oral route of giving more focus to the side characters as the series went on in order to flesh out the world. Although, unlike Moral Oral, the characters would not take over the show come seasons 4 and 5. Frank Zappa, a longtime friend of Cupo, came on to do the music, providing this quirky, bizarre music style for a show that would appear to be exactly that, but upon watching it, the audience would find it to be a lot more grounded than they would have expected. From what I could find, it seems like the biggest issue that the team faced during season 1 was trimming their episode down enough to fit in a 22 minute time slot since in comics you can usually have your stories go on for however long you want. There will of course be some guidelines in place but the pacing is all up to you. As for a 22 minute TV show there are strict rules in place that a network will never break. I think one thing was there was just a constant struggle to keep the script short enough. We tried to do 40 pages or under. Doing that would make the animation production much easier. Sometimes Sometimes we'd have finished animation we had to cut. The show had to be 22 minutes. And to accommodate, we'd have to cut out 10 minutes sometimes. Wow, 10 minutes of Duckman content that had to go to waste? I really hope that's on the complete series DVD, because I gotta see it. Speaking of cuts, one of the most integral members of the comic book cast had to be cut for the show. That would be Duckman's wife. Yes, not too many people know this, but Duckman was married in the comics. The reason she was cut from, most of, the series was because the crew felt that there would be a lot more opportunities with having her gone. For instance, instead of getting in arguments with the love of his life, Duckman would now be at odds with his grumpy sister-in-law who just so happened to be willed the house that he and his wife live in. A lot more jokes and stories could arise from this than having the wife stick around. After all, for the show to work, Duckman's gotta be miserable. At long last, Duckman was finally ready to premiere, and on March 5th, 1994, the premiere episode debuted to good reviews, but some very, very low ratings. This wasn't because people weren't interested in the show, far from it. Those that actually watched USA thought that the show was intriguing and decided to give it a shot. It's just that not too many people seemed to fit in that category. Despite the lackluster ratings, the good reviews were enough for USA to give Duckman another shot. Now Duckman season 2 was officially underway. The only problem was that Frank Zappa was no longer able to do the music. During the production of season 1, he got sick and had to leave the show. He ended up dying not too long before its premiere. Scott Wilkes came in to fill the role, successfully recapturing the energy to Zappa's music. Those who didn't read the credits might not know that anything had changed. Around this time, the show was starting to gain some traction. Not enough to be a household name or anything, but it was certainly doing better than it was when it first came out. It even got nominated for an Emmy. Actually, Duckman would get nominated nominated for an Emmy every year it was in production. It never won, but still it's an honor to be nominated. Despite getting some more attention, season 2 still wasn't considered a success. Peck was convinced that this would be the end of the show. USA gave them two chances to catch on, and they could never manage to do it. But much to everybody's surprise, especially Peck's, USA greenlit them for one more season, which
which would later be split into two. Things continue to go as normal, with some crew members leaving here and there, and new ones being brought on, and there was one instance of network interference involving the weird science cast being brought on as guest stars, which the crew wasn't exactly thrilled with. But hey, they already had tons of other guest stars that they were happy to work with, like say, uh, oh, I don't know, just to name a few, uh, Jim Belushi, David Duchovny, Lisa Kudrow, Coolio, Bobcat Goldthwait, Leonard Nimoy, Brendan Fraser, Ben Stiller, Carl Reiner, and Heather Locklear. So yeah, I guess Duckman could take one for the team. But that wasn't the only thing that the Duckman creators were upset with the network about. They were constantly let in by unfitting shows like wrestling or sports coverage, things that their target audience didn't exactly like. Not helping was that the show was shunted around from time slot to time slot more time than the crew could count. But even then, if it wasn't for that, Duckman would still be having a hard time. The show only cost $600,000 per episode to make. Now that was pretty cheap, but that meant that it was hard to make the show look good with that small of a budget. They were running on fumes. But even with that small budget, the show's ratings were so low that it was never able to turn a profit. Even when the time slots were stable, they would never get higher than 2 million views. These days where cable is dying a slow and painful death, that's not all too bad. But back then, in one of television's biggest heydays, that was atrocious. But even so, the show pressed on. Similar to the last two seasons, season 3 got some good reviews, and there was also a Duckman comic book series produced by Topps Comics that was running around the same time. Yeah, Duckman went from comic to show, then back to comic. Season 4, also known as Season 3 Part 2, did see the rise of the first, and so far only, Duckman video game. Hmm, it's a book of matches. Why, if I weren't having the time of my life floating in the lap of luxury, and other people's drippings, I'd walk over and take a closer look at him. Duckman The Graphic Adventures from 1997. One of the very few instances, along with the Topps Comics spin-off, got some major merchandise. Season 4 took some risks, even ending on a cliffhanger that would break the show forever, but not even that was enough to save the show. The ratings were too low for USA to justify giving it another season. This caught the crew by surprise. Especially Peck, who felt that if USA didn't cancel them after a season 2's bad ratings, they might not get cancelled because of ratings at all. And it was a shame too because they had so many more stories to tell. I mean, again, look at how it ended. The show may have been over, but the cult following it created was not. And it only got stronger as the years went on. So big that CBS decided to release season by season installments of the show on DVD. They would be edited to remove the licensed music, but other than that, the episodes were mostly intact. As for Peck, he never got to work on Duckman again, but he did get to work on Squirrel Boy. Wow, that title finally makes sense. Duck Man, Squirrel Boy. This should not be blowing my mind, but it is. <laughs> While Squirrel Boy was made for families, it had the same mission statements as Duckman in mind, having versatile and well-written characters, as well as a world that's fantastical and weird, but beyond that, would still feel like our own. Much like Duckman though, the series was never able to find an audience, and was cancelled after two short seasons. According to Peck, it's unlikely that there's going to be any more Duckman content in the future, but since it seems like Hollywood is rebooting anything that moves, especially if it has a cult following, I mean, take a look at Clone High, maybe Duckman will finally get a shot to resolve that cliffhanger. But probably not. And that, my friends, is the story of Duckman. The show that walked, or I guess, crawled on the road while starving to death begging for food, so that shows like King of the Hill, Futurama, and even Family Guy could run. Though perhaps, especially in the case of Family Guy, overfed? Okay, I'm starting to lose control of the analogy here. Let's just get on to the outro. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? think. What do you think of Duckman and what do you think is the craziest thing that happened behind the scenes? Comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Now I don't take requests on media mementos, but so many people have been saying you gotta do Duckman versus the network. You gotta do it. But it wasn't really screwed by the network outside of the time slot changes, you know? As for the lead in programming, they had to put it somewhere and they didn't have many other shows like it. What else could they do? Besides, as I 
I mentioned before, USA was too small to have a show like this on their network and have it survive. Though with that being said, I do actually agree with Peck that putting it on Fox would have made it die sooner, so uh, yeah, I guess make that what you will. Anyways, it's time to thank our wonderful Patreon people, starting with our Masters of Fate. Channel 11, Drew the Stew, Ellis Amir Rogers Archer, Kev Messick, Platinum Base, Quiet Chap, Ryan Williams, Timey, and Woody Woo, and now our executive producers, Albert Robinson, Blackjack, H.R. Hoffman, Indiscreet One, Leaf Storm, Ravioli Supremo, Unkale, and who else but Zane? If you two would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then please consider donating to the Patreon. There's a link in the description below for you to check out. There are also links to the Media Mementos Discord server, as well as the second channel, Media Mementos Extra, where we have behind the scenes videos, short clips, and other sorts of subjectively entertaining things. All right, folks, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time. It's us, Japan, this. Huh.